If there's one thing we've learned in the past few weeks, it's that we're herd animals. Human beings share everything, including snot and spittle, according to the public health people. And we're far more dependent on one another than our pre-COVID lifestyles may have led us to believe. From about 1980 to say now, many of us Western Europeans at least, were under the impression that we were individuals with rights to privacy, freedom to travel, and the money to enjoy both. But the lockdown has shown us that we are really interdependent. The weddings, birthdays, and holidays that have had to be canceled, we're not going to be held alone. In countries across the world, highlights of life and rites of passage tend to be centered on large social gatherings of friends and families. So in some ways, for a social policy scholar like me, the lockdown's a bit of a boom. It allows me to demonstrate two things. First, solidarity between generations is everywhere. When the lockdown is lifted, the first thing we will do is hug our elderly parents or our young grandchildren. Second, social policy, which is the study of human welfare, matters. For years now, people in my profession have been fighting against neoliberal claims that there's no such thing as social solidarity. That people are free agents who can and should take care of themselves and only themselves. COVID-19, and in particular the physical or social distancing measures that have been brought in to halt the spread of the virus, have thrown all of that out. The lockdown has shown us how much we depend on each other and how much of that is intergenerational. Let me explain exactly what I mean by solidarity between generations. Solidarity between generations is one of those things that's so mundane, so everyday, so common, that like clean water and fresh air, it gets taken for granted. If you have children, when you got up this morning, you made them breakfast, you got them ready for school. And because it is the middle of a lockdown, you probably taught school as well. You may not be a great teacher. You're slightly confused about the precise definition of a pronoun, but you still did it. That is solidarity between generations. If you have parents, you may have dropped groceries off to your mum and dad who are over 70 and so not allowed to out. And if you're young, and if you're involved in a local sports club, you might be one of those young guys who've been putting together food parcels to drop off to older people who aren't related to you, but still need the help. If you did any of these things, then you were engaging in solidarity between generations. So this is what I mean about it being everywhere. And this solidarity between people of different ages, it's been a mainstay of human societies for as long as we can remember. And this is why social, social policy scholars like me study in detail how it translates from the individual level to community level to national level through the welfare state and even up to international level. At national level, the welfare state is funded by taxes and social insurance that workers are paying. And this funds the schools and pensions of younger and older people. And they do this because they benefited from other generations paying for their education when they were younger. And they know that their pensions will be funded by people who may not even have been born yet. Internationally, we have young environmental activists like Greta Thunberg, who are fighting for the rights of future generations just to have an earth to live on. The reason I want to bring this solidarity between generations to your attention in the context of the current pandemic is because I studied solidarity between generations in a previous crisis. And I believe that it could play an important role in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. I was involved in a study of solidarity between generations in Ireland in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis, when Ireland was paying the price of a flagrant economic policy with one of the harshest austerity programmes in Europe. We found that in times of greatest hardship, people came together across the generations. 
I will never forget interviewing a retired bank manager who was paying the mortgages of two of his children in their entirety because they had lost their jobs. The solidarity we found was genuine. It was not temporary or convenient. It was so deeply part of the social worlds of family and community that for much of the time it went unnoticed. In the end, we concluded that it was the main reason Ireland's austerity programme passed without major civil unrest. At the moment, we're experiencing the flip side of solidarity between generations. Generational solidarity is the reason why we're finding the lockdown so hard. To keep children away from their grandparents, to avoid our siblings, to give our local football club a wide berth, it goes against our natural instinct. This is why solidarity between generations must be a central part of society's recovery from COVID-19. We must use this ability to make sacrifices on behalf of others to build support for a stronger health system, fair and decent social care for people with disabilities, a range of educational initiatives to help children and young people catch up on the schooling they've missed. When the lockdown is finally lifted, when you're at last allowed to hug your grandchildren or have a drink with your dad, remember this. Remember this period of generational isolation. Remember how odd it felt to live without other generations. Remember how much we can and should rely on solidarity between generations to build a more stable, secure and sustainable future for everyone.